Dave Sussman back with you at Whiskey Politics, and you can find us at America's Voice News, YouTube, and all of your favorite podcast applications, including the Ricochet Audio Network, iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Delighted to be back with Bill Whittle and uh, to have been invited into the famous Bill Whittle studio. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. And it's also great having you back on, and uh, we were just talking before uh, we started filming. Last time we had you on, we were t chatting about culture and Star Wars, and uh, that particular video is still on YouTube. Folks find it. Uh, it's still getting a lot of comments and a lot of action. People are really genuinely concerned about how Hollywood and the Hollywood left are basically taking uh, the canons of, of our childhood and uh, some of the greatest uh, storylines ever told and changing it to suit their social uh, social policies, aren't they? Yeah, they didn't just make a bad Star Wars movie with the last one, Dave. They unmade all the previous Star Wars movie. It's like somebody went back and started handing you a Bible and the new Bible says that you know, that Jesus didn't heal anybody. It was Mary Magdalene that did all the healing and that Judas was actually a patriot for, for bringing an end to this comp, that kind of thing. When yeah. they're, they're rewriting the entire essence of it. And since we spoke last, it's just been again and again and again. Uh, there's a, a big, big video game release called Battlefield Five that absolutely tanked because they had um, women in essentially what was the 82nd Airborne, you know, jumping out of airplanes. And, and a lot of players were saying, we don't have any problem with women characters we're just playing a world war ii game here and it just seems a little odd to hear uh, you know the, these voices to which the studio replied well you're just a bunch of ignorant uneducated misogynists uh and um buy it or don't buy it so they didn't buy it mm -hmm. and then i just saw two days ago uh, doctor who which has been on the air for 52 53 years something like that the latest incarnation of the doctor i think it's number 12 uh, is the first woman doctor, mm -hmm. um, but uh, unlike all of the other uh, doctors, uh, she has no idiosyncrasy. She has no particular uh, character quirks that make those doctors so unique. She's a female, and her entire uh, character uh, quirk is to is to basically spout feminist ideology and 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 constantly just have a chance to tell men how stupid they are, which also the fans are not too fond of. So you know, w and this goes back to that last uh, episode where we had you on. The decisions that are being made right now in corporate Hollywood, mm -hmm. in those boardrooms, yep. they believe that these are the right decisions, not just for their bottom line, but for society. But the audience is saying something else, aren't they? They're fighting back. What about the Gillette ad? Okay, so Gillette comes out with an ad that basically says, um, basically in a nutshell it says, you know, we're the we're the razor of a new kind of man, uh, mm -hmm. not that old toxic masculinity. You know that that everybody's so so right uh, rightly you know um, disgusted with. We're we're uh, we're the razor for the new kind of you know softer, gentler kind of guy, and um, everybody saw that commercial and said, "I'm just never buying Gillette again ever." Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the the slogan is, "Wait, you know, go uh, get woke, go broke." And somebody's telling these companies that this is gonna be good for them, but it's an easy sell because this is what they wanna hear. That's certainly what the movie studios wanna hear. They wanna hear, we need more left-wing content. We need more progressive content. And fans are just abandoning these, these enormously expensive and, and revenue-producing franchises. They're broken, they're gone. Star Trek's gone. Uh, Star Wars is gone. Ghostbusters was a catastrophe. Doctor Who now. Most of the video games. I saw the trailers for upcoming video games. They're all first-person shooters. And a female character was the lead in every single one of them. Out there, you know, in the mud. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's not to say that women can't play those games. It, it's just simply to say that the, the primary players of these games have left this world to play computer games to escape from this nonsense in the first place and now it's following them. I've got a friend uh, producer guy he uh, works on a show called The Orville which is a sure. new reincarnation of the Star Trek. Well it's a comedy it, it's a parody but yeah. And it's with the guy that did Family Seth Guy. Seth uh, McFarlane. Seth McFar McFarlane and Ted who I actually enjoyed those that movie. Um, but from what I, and I haven't seen it, honestly, but what I have heard is that it is so socially left, it is so progressive, that there is a planet where, I, from what I understand, it's all males. There's a storyline in there, I'm not sure if you saw it yourself, there's a storyline where it's all males, yet they could have babies. No, I haven't seen it, but that's, <laughs> but I think, I think actually Doctor Who, the, the, the last season, the catastrophe season, I think there's, there might have, I might have seen a still of, of a man having a baby on that too. 
And this is yeah. the goal, right? I mean, this is this is what they have to do. When when you let the beta males take over the society along with the feminists, you've got to make sure that the alpha males, which would normally come along and kick your ass, you've got to make sure that they are uh, essentially um, neutered, turned off. So yeah, so yeah. so they're they're demonized in in public, and so young men in coming out of high schools today, high schools today. They're told that they're potential rapists at any given time. You know, it's just a matter of time before they rape some woman and mm -hmm. toxic masculinity. And, and they're basically that you're defective girls and you should be quiet and, 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 and share like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so these young men are just, they know what happens if they, if they stand up to the left-wing narrative. Martina Navratilova, who's a champion of, of uh, gay rights, was just crucified for saying that mm -hmm. you can't have men competing with women. It's not fair. And mm -hmm. so these young people basically say, all right, I know, I'm not going to argue and they disappear down into the uh, basement or into their bedrooms and they enter a computer game world where things make sense. We're so divided today as far as what media we watch, we kind of more or less go to our own echo chambers and after the, the break coming up here in a few minutes, I wanna talk more specifically about this, especially how it applies to conservative media, liberal media and, and, and discussing politics today. But before we get to that, um, when we talk about the culture, when we talk about turning on the Netflix or the Amazons and we're watching what we wanna watch, how is this impacting uh, behavior. Are we able to have those water cooler discussions today where we're no longer, uh, we used to all share the same, same shows. Right? That's right. And, no, and now it's like, oh, have you seen? No. Have you seen? No. There, that, that's, that's exactly right. That's something I've been very concerned about. Um, the internet allows you to see anything you want to whatever time you want to, mm -hmm. which essentially means, I'm probably exaggerating, but not by much, no two people are watching the same thing at the same time. Right. When we had broadcast television, you know, Sunday nights was just miserable because if you're a kid on Sunday night, it's either Hee Haw or 60 Minutes, neither of which I, I found particularly appealing. <laughs> but we all watched Gilligan's Island, and we all watched Star right. Trek, and we all watched I Dream of Genie, and we all watched um, Beverly Hillbillies, and all of these shows. Yeah. And they have uh, kind of, they have the same kind of binding quality that any mythology has. It, it, it keeps everybody in the culture on the same kind of cultural page. Uh, so not only is, is the culture turning far more left, but it's becoming so fragmentary that no two people are sharing the same experiences anymore. Yeah. And since entertainment is hypnosis, you basically are now in a situation where uh, people are getting an extremely negative uh, hypnotic message implanted in their heads. No one is sharing that message. People aren't talking to each other. Best friends in a restaurant of, of a certain age and younger. You'll see, you'll see a room full, you'll see a table of eight, eight or 10 people in their 20s. Mm -hmm. All best friends, somebody's birthday party, all of them down here. Nobody's talking, nobody's communicating. We're just going right down these narrow channels and it's something to worry about. Does that, I mean, are you concerned about the ability for us to actually e even communicate? I mean, go down two generations, three generations from now. Our kids, our great grandkids are, you know, what's going to happen to the point of actually communicating how you feel about a certain issue and actually conveying and being articulate when nobody's talking anymore? Well, uh, part of, of, of life and wisdom is reflection, right? Is the ability to sit and think about things and just kind of think about what you believe, what happened, mm -hmm. how do you feel? Nobody, has re nobody reflects anymore. I have to tell you a very quick story. I was taking an Uber back after my car was getting repaired. I was in the back seat and the guy up front was listening to a podcast from a YouTube marketing guru. And the marketing guru, you could tell, was like 21, 22 years old. And he's saying, no, no, and he, no, 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 and no, no. And he's saying, he's saying, oh, and let me say one thing about long format videos, okay? Yeah. He says, you long format videos absolutely can work if their if their production values are good enough if they're interesting enough if they keep moving people will watch they'll, they'll watch three they'll sometimes they'll go to four minutes mm -hmm. so long format videos four minutes mm -hmm. that's three minutes really so mm -hmm. that's when i realized something uh you know dave if if the attention span of of millennials is is three minutes then they can't read yeah. the entire generation can't read and if i said to them that you can't read they'd say be, don't be ridiculous, give me something and they'd read it. Yes, it's true they can deconstruct the sentence and tell what the sentence means, <sighs> but if you can't spend more than two minutes at a task, you can't read the book. If I gave them Moby Dick, it's not that they couldn't understand the words, it's just they couldn't even begin the book, let alone right. finish it, they can't read. Right, right. Well, listen, I want to talk about this and how it relates to our media that we're currently in right now after sure. the break, including um, an evening that we spent watching Dave Rubin. And uh, we'll be right back at Whiskey Politics. Dave Sussman sitting here with Bill Whittle.
Dave Sussman back with you at Whiskey Politics and uh, sitting with Bill Whittle. You can find Bill at BillWhittle.com. That's the place. And uh, he's got a membership site there. He's got incredible content and I highly recommend everybody follow Bill. And you can also follow us on YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play and iTunes as well as the Ricochet Audio Network and of course America's Voice News. Uh, last time we saw each other, a couple of months ago, we went out, we had a great evening with some friends, and uh, we watched uh, Dave Rubin, who most uh, people watching us also know, and uh, he did uh, an evening where he talked on stage, it was labeled stand-up, but it was more, you know, philosophical and socio sociology uh, discussions about what's going on in the media, and he had a couple of guests on, the Weinstein brothers. Um, it was interesting because I thought uh, whatever your opinions are of Dave Rubin and the Weinsteins, uh, the intellectual dark web and all of that, that's not what this question is about. It's more about the discussion that came out from that evening and that is that you've got people on the left and you've got people on the right that are talking today and they're talking in an environment where um, it, I almost feel as if they are cocooning certain elements of conservatism, and this is conservatism we can accept here and conservatism we can't accept there. Uh, classic liberalism belongs in this block over here. And I felt that uh, it was more divisive than anything because we're at a stage right now, and, and tell me if I'm wrong here, Bill, I know you've spoken about this before, we're not able to talk to each other anymore. And the left and the right, one thing, but now we've got these divisions or subdivisions, if you're a Rush listener, uh, to, to, to conservatism. And it's splitting us apart. What are the solutions to this where we can come together and actually sit down and break bread with those on the left that we believe we have common ends, maybe we just don't have the same means? Did you say break bread or break heads? <laughs> um, I, yeah. Um, so look, I, I agree with you completely, and I think I think it's tearing the country apart. And and it, it, I'm reluctant to begin with a talk about how to bring people together with with an observation about something that's a little divisive. But I think it has to be said yeah. in order to solve the problem. Um, Dave was hilarious. Dave made j jokes about a bunch of things, a lot of jokes with gays people, all of the stuff, all of these very you know. Things that things that progressives think that conservatives were very very huffy about, mm -hmm. and the room was almost entirely conservative, and everybody laughed, had a great time, everybody applauded, everything was great. These two progressive guys came out on the stage, and and one of them talked about how he had been chased off his college campus by progressives, because he wandered this far off of the um, the narrative, and they lay, basically came at him with you know with pitchforks and torches and ran him off of his own campus. And we all know that when Ben Shapiro or Milo or anybody else tries to speak at a, at a college university, there are protests, there are shouting matches, they burn the buildings down in some cases. So we know what happens to conservative speakers in front of progressive audiences. But I did a piece on this called Asymmetrical Civility because I don't think I've ever been more proud of being a conservative in my life. This room was filled with conservatives and liberals were, were making the most progressive statements that you can imagine and, and, and the conservatives in the audience were sitting there listening quietly and respectfully and after every single thing they said there was a, a polite round of applause. You know, there was no catcalling, there, no, there was no jeering, it was, it was respectful and decent and I said to them, don't you see the difference here? We, we can't go and have this conversation at Berkeley, but you can have this conversation here. Don't you find that odd? Don't you find that interesting, something remarkable? So look, I, I don't want to start this whole thing off by saying, well, they're, you know, they're, they're just a lot meaner than we are, but they're just a lot meaner than we are. And, and I suspect this is due to the fact that we have to, that we're exposed to the, the left-wing story all the time, every day, all day, every day. That's all we get through the news media and the pop cultures and TV shows and so on. I think when they hear uh, a contrary opinion, it causes them a lot greater stress. And I think if you don't recognize that, you're probably not gonna be off to a good start. So uh, let's put that to the side a mm -hmm. minute because we are talking about how to sit down and, right. and, and as I said, break bread, not heads, with, with those that uh, completely disagree with us. I'm going to take the margins out of this equation here. Sure. The 10% on either couldn't side. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Yeah, that's pointless to argue with. Okay, about because people. we're at a point, and I want to talk about this with you later in the interview, we're at a point right now where these are the people that are creating their news being upfed through Twitter. Right. Okay? Dismiss those. We're, let's say 80%, 40% on either side of the aisle, okay, are more thought they are. Uh, they they have uh, a lot of similarities. We want some of the same things. We want some different things. Okay, 
uh, when we're sitting down and we have a situation where, and I, 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 the reason that I brought this up was because I enjoyed that evening, and like you said, Dave Rubin, and you've been on his show, okay? Uh, the, 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 the discussion was really geared towards um, conservatism and where it's going wrong, right? From the Weinstein brothers that I thought were, were they had a lot to say, they are very uh, smart, intelligent people, but the intellectuals, the intellectuals are now, if you are not of a certain, I'll give you a quick example here. Um, some of the folks that came out against the Covington story immediately were on the right, okay? They came out against the kid, right? And they said, oh, this is insane. Uh, if you're wearing a MAGA hat, you're a racist. And they're really being fed into uh, this wood chipper that has been set up by the left, right? And, and we can stand back and we can say, hold on a minute. No, first of all, I, I may not be in quote unquote intellectual, but I believe that there is two sides to every coin here. Let's take a breath, right? And going back to that evening here, I think that when we have a discussion with those on the right, and if you consider yourself one of the right, um, where, does that, where does that discussion allow us to find common ground? You may not like this president, you may like his policies, mm -hmm. but you are automatically dismissed as a MAGA, pro-Trump wearing, you know, almost racist. Maybe you're not racist, but you certainly align well, yourself with them. Anybody who voted for Trump is racist, according to most progressives. So what do we do about that? Is that, is that basically the question? Um, you know, I think, I think a couple things. When I did a, uh, Dave Rubin's interview, I said, you know, Dave, we both come from pretty bit different backgrounds and we're able to talk to each other. And I have no doubt whatsoever that if we were to take 10 of my followers and 10 of your followers and 22 of us go into a room someplace, we could come out with a political platform in an hour that 85% of the American people would, would enthusiastically vote for. Agreed. Absolutely no question about it. There's no question about it. Um, so if it were up to me, uh, the first thing I would do is I would I would have people come out uh, in a in a panel, and I'd have them all shake hands. That's the first thing I would do. I have them shake hands and shake hands and smile and say, "Hey, you know, we're here for the same reason. We love this country. We want it. We want it to be a place where everybody's happy. I want people to be happy. You want people to be happy." And I think there's only two rules that we would have. The first rule would be, to the best of our ability, it would take a while because of just so many habits, but to the best of our ability, we're not going to use the word Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, progressive. Libertarian. We're not going to use those words. We're just going to, if they come up, we're just going to, sorry, and we're just going to put them aside and start dealing with issues and, and ideas. That's the, that's the first thing I would do. And I, I think the second thing that I would do is I would, I would make this about, oh, when I say make it about what people want, I think the second rule and the most important rule, and the only rule I would ever insist on in a debate of any kind with anybody is, you can tell me what you think, but you don't get to tell me what I think. If I tell you something, you don't have the right to say, no, that's not what you think. In other words, if I tell you that I want to see every American happy and that I think black people, Mex Mexicans, Hispanics, the whole thing, I think the whole dividing of the country up into tribes is a catastrophe. This is a nation of individuals. You don't get to say to me, no, that's not what you really think. What you really think is you're a racist. You want to see people put back on plantations. So if you have those two rules, you know, civility, uh, let's get rid of these of these uh, terms that are so entrenching now. You know, it, oh, okay, so the conservatives are this. Well, then the liberals are that. No, just we're going to put those terms away. Start dealing with the issues. But but basically, the, the main thing is, if you want to have a discussion about something, I'm telling you the truth, and you don't get to tell me I'm lying. I've said things, uh, you know, where people have said to me, well, you're really a racist. I said, I've just spent the last two hours talking about individuality, and I'm talking about the antithesis of racism. And they say, yeah, you're just trying to cover it up. Mm -hmm. Cover what up? Well, you, so you're saying my entire career is based on covering up what I really believe so I don't get in trouble with you guys who hate me anyway? It's just insane. You don't get to tell me how I think. And I think if you did those two things, you'd be well on your way. So. Take away the assumptions, take away the labels. Mm -hmm. And now we can talk. And we can talk. And I think that's brilliant. Oh, it's a and good start. I know, I do. And I think that what we're looking at here is a way for us to, con uh, I mean, we're, we're not the extreme. 
Okay, we, want, oh, we all want the same things, and I think that if we're able to sit down and uh, have this dialogue with each other, I think there's a lot of people that are going to be able to come to the table and say, okay, let's figure out the solution. We're going to take another quick break, and we're going to come back, and I want to talk a little bit now about politics. Sure. And uh, when we get back, we're going to talk about the wall and obviously what just happened with the shutdown. We'll be right back. Bill Whittle, David Sussman here with Whiskey Politics. <laughs> And Dave Sussman back with you with uh, Bill Whittle here at Whiskey Politics in his studios. And um, by the way, if you're seeing the halos on the screen, just call us Simon, Simon Templer today. Yeah, and um, since this is my personal studio, as you can see, it's nothing but mirrors, just mirrors everywhere, <laughs> mirrors, walls, <laughs> mirrored ceilings. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm fond of looking at myself. So you must have seen Dudley Moore in, uh, what was that? Uh, what was what was the movie with Chevy Chase? Uh, uh, I don't remember that. Well, he had the mirrors on the ceiling no. and everything else. Um, he anyway, was just immortal as Arthur. Foul play or something yeah. like that. Anyway, Goldie Hawn. All right. Um, so we just came off of one of the most divisive periods in American history in relation to the president and Congress, and we're referring to the government shutdown. Uh, it was shut down for, for over a month. Uh, they say something along the lines of 800,000 people went to forego their paychecks. There was a lot of misery in the mainstream news. Uh, and my heart goes out to those individuals. Me too. Okay. Um, but uh, we are now kind of like a surfer sitting between two swells. We're waiting for that next, uh, that next set to come in because within the next week or two, uh, Trump is going to come out and either say, okay, let's uh, figure this thing out. We're going to have another shutdown or I'm going to have an executive order. Mm -hmm. All right. What are we looking at right now as far as the politics of this, as far as the uh, financial aspect of this and its impact on the discussion of the wall at the border? I think we are living in a post-government America. I don't think this is a government anymore, and I don't think it has been a real functioning government for a long time. Um, one of the fundamental, absolutely base things that, that the legislature is supposed to do, forget about all of their agendas and all of the laws they want to write, their, their, their primary function is to uh, approve or, or uh, you know, reject the president's budget. And under Barack Obama, we went six years without a budget. There was no budget in the United States for six years. Nothing came out of the Senate, nothing. And what that means is, is that it is so broken. I talked to an admiral down in um, San Diego. He said, we have an enormous problem where we can't get our ships repaired and maintenance done on them because we went to private contractors. And now I go to a private contractor and I say, I've got this, this aircraft carrier that needs refurbishing. It's, a, you know, it's an $80 million job or whatever the number is. And he says, the contractor cannot hire the people he needs to hire because I can't sign a contract saying that this is a two-year job. I'm not, I don't know where the money's gonna be in six months. I don't have a budget from the, from the government. And so I have, to, I have to try and repair my ships in, in six-month increments, depending on how much money gets allocated. So it, it's not functioning. Um, and, and I think t to some degree, while I completely agree with you about the individuals, m most of the individuals that work in government are fine people and, and they're, they're trying to do their best and I've had good experiences with many of them. So I'm not talking about them, but government as an idea is, um, is just plain, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because, it doesn't work in the, in, in the case of many cases where the government is essentially a company that's being run by its own employees. And there is no back and forth between the government. There is no force saying you should spend less. No one is saying you should spend less. No one in the government is saying Only that. candidates. Candidates will say it, and then they'll go out there and they'll proceed to, to, to spend right. more. And, and unlike a private company, if, if the United States, you know, currently $25 trillion in deficit plus $200 trillion, and we could say $200 trillion or $25 trillion, nobody has any idea how much money that is. The current amount of money that we owe, somebody did a graphic on, if you take flat $100 bills and you make them into the size of the World Trade Center, I think we owe 23 of those mm -hmm. made out of $100 bills. That's what we owe. And it, could, and it gets bigger every day. So if this was a company, we would have been bankrupt a long time ago, and that would have been good. Because if, the, if it had been a company that could have gone out of business, then the crummy management would have been chucked out the window and, and we would have looked for people who would manage the money responsibly. Save a little bit, you know, uh, get the best value for what you spend, but the money doesn't belong to anybody. So, it can, and when you run out, you can just print some more. So, 
it, it's not a government. And, and the thing, I, when I first started getting this idea, we were talking about this idea of non-discretionary spending. For example, uh, Social Security or Medicaid, let's take Medicaid, it's $230 billion, somewhere in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. They can't cut that number. The Congress does not have the power to reduce that number. Mm -hmm. So if the government doesn't have the ability to change how we spend $230,000 million, then it's not really a government, is it? It's a thing. It, it's a thing that is moving out of control and accelerating, and nobody can stop it. And if you tell me that you are, as an, electorate, as an elected representative of the U.S. Congress with legislative powers for the budget of this United States, and you're telling me that we can't change that number, we can't cut it, then I'm telling you, you're somebody somewhere is in serious violation of their constitutional oath. You're not a government, and this isn't a government. This is, this is a thing that is moving and unstoppable. So you have this, this unstoppable train, if you will, yep. okay? And it sounds to me like that whether you're a candidate and you get elected, you become a congressperson, you're a senator, or even a president, and as far as citizens go, everybody is just a passenger on this unmovable, uh, this, this force that is unstoppable. The conductors are passengers. The engineers are passengers. The passengers have always been passengers, but now the engineers are passenger. If he sees that we're heading up to a steep cliff, the elected uh, officials. If we, if, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the entire. Yes, yeah. the entire people we elect to run the government. Mm -hmm. If he sees that we're heading for a hairpin turn, or if he sees that the bridge is out, he cannot stop the machine. So he's not in control of it either. It's not a government if it can't control. If if they if the government says as they always do, we can't touch that money. Well, who, what do you mean you can't touch it? Mm -hmm. Well, we promised it to people. Well. <laughs> You know, maybe you can't make promises like that, you know? Who controls two, you know, $230,000 million for Medicare? Can't touch it. Really? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that concern you? That is an engineer and a, who is looking at, at in upcoming catastrophe, knows we're getting closer, and he not only cannot stop the train, if he tries to slow it down, he's going to have the door, you know, knocked down and be beaten to death by half of the passengers. Is one solution, it won't solve the whole thing, but one solution to this, term limits? Well, if you had, my solution would be term limits with one term, but then I realized that even, even that's not gonna do it. Politicians have been despised by every culture throughout history. It's never been different. There's never been a, a culture where the common people really looked up to their politicians as a general rule. And the reason, I think, is because there's a certain kind of person that goes into politics. And that's the kind of person that, that understands that on some level, it's easier to shake hands, knock on doors, get elected, and then have all the trappings of, of wealth and power and prestige than it is to go out and actually earn it. And so the people that go into politics are people who, have, who are wired to want to tell other people what to do. And the only people that could stop them are people who don't want to tell other people what to do. And getting people like that to go into Washington and tell the people who are telling other people what to do to stop doing that, it's virtually impossible. So the left, the best minds in the left go into politics. And in, on the right, the best minds go into business and the military. And, and, and it's an almost impossible thing to say that I want you to elect me to go to Washington so that I will have less power and less money to spend than, than we did when I got there. Gotcha. I think one of the greatest things that we're seeing right now is that uh, we are having this discussion. And uh, listen, whatever your opinion is of Donald Trump, uh -huh. okay, hate him, love him, support him, don't like him, but support his issues, whatever, wherever you fall, you have to admit that uh, the, the, uh, the powers that be hate this. They hate somebody coming in, bull in China shop, basically cracking everything that they created over the N past 50 yeah, years. Now you're on the main vein. Right. This is it. This is it exactly. Um, the left sees uh, Donald Trump as, as vulgar, uncouth, crass, you know, stupid, mm -hmm. liar. And in general terms, the right says, well, maybe that, that, that probably is all true. Um, but we don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't care because the 2016 election was all the evidence we ever needed that the American people made the wrong choice according to the people in Washington, that, w that the American people made a mistake and the American people will never be allowed to make a mistake like that again, which is why you suppress all half of these, you know, conservative uh, outlets are all being suppressed. 
when the government when the government has decided, FBI director, and the, the head law enforcement official in the United States, and, and the entire group, when you find that when you find that people leave top levels of the Democratic Party and marry top level executives of the news media, yeah. and this isn't like a one time thing. This whole thing is welded together. I think it's fair to say that most conservatives, there are many, many conservatives that just really love Donald Trump, love him, love his personality, love all things about him. Right. Uh, I'm not one of those people, but I do think if it hadn't been for him, we would have been in, in such a cyst that there'd be no recovering the country. We'll be right back with Bill Whittle. We're talking about everything, politics, culture, from BillWhittle.com at his studios here, Dave Sussman at Whiskey Politics. <laughs> Welcome back, Dave Sussman here with Bill Whittle and a couple of other issues that I want to talk with you here in this last segment. Uh, first of all, finishing up what you were just talking about regarding how Donald Trump is a threat to the powers that be, both left and right. Is that something that you feel with the election now in full swing with all of these Democrats throwing their hat in the ring is still going to be a main motivator for him in 2020? For Trump? For Trump. For his base and for, for others. Well, for needless voters. to say, the, 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 the base it's a strange thing, you know. I think the people that were the most fervently pro-Trump, pro uh, Ann Coulter, for example, mm -hmm. are terribly, terribly disappointed uh, by the failure to make any action on the wall. And she certainly makes that uh, abundant, no. abundantly clear. Mm -hmm. And paradoxically, I think the people who were um, a little more tepid about Donald Trump are more impressed than they than they thought they would be. Mm -hmm. Not by his character or by his um, elocution or by his manners, mm -hmm. but impressed by the fact that, okay, you know, on the second day in office, he drops the largest non-nuclear weapon in the arsenal on ISIS, and you don't hear about ISIS murdering anybody anymore because we go out and kill ISIS now. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about this in this segment, so, so this is a good segue. So let me just I'll yeah, just I'll just kind of continue the, the role here. Mm -hmm. So just now, we just earlier this morning got these figures. So the government's been shut down for 30 days, and according to the people who believe that the government is the society, that everything is, should be run by the government, mm -hmm. this should have caused a collapse. But as it turns out, they were expecting 176,000 new jobs. They got 203,000 new jobs. There were more new jobs created when the government shut down than they expected there to be, and. And so when you get into these kind of things, you know, if you just look at, if you were to take Barack Obama's record and Donald Trump's record and completely invert them, mm. they'd be building golden statues to, to uh, Barack Obama, Donald Trump now. Mm -hmm. You know, Barack Obama's best year was what, 0.9% economic growth? And we have 4.5, something like that. And, and so the answer to this is, I don't, see, I think Dave, I think this really is, I genuinely, genuinely believe this. And, and it's not intended to be mean because it's it's just a it's just the way people are wired. Mm -hmm. There are some people who would rather f who would, it's more important for some people to feel good about doing something even if it does harm, and then there are other people who are willing to feel bad about doing something if it does good. The feels outweigh the reals. Th yes, <laughs> yes, and so and so back to what we were talking about bringing the two sides together. You know, there there are there are statements that you can make that are very healing, and, mm -hmm. and one of them is one of my favorites. I came up with just on the spot when I was, um, you know, doing a question and answer period. We're talking about health care and Obamacare and stuff, and I said, look, if health care were really free, I'd be in favor of free health care. What kind of a jackass would I have to be yeah. to say no free health care for you? I don't like the color of your skin. No, 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 no free health care for you. If health care were free, I'd be a liberal on health care. But it's not free. It's exceedingly expensive. And so it's not free, so it's not, and I'm not. And when you say that, you kind of disarm people who have, who, who have decided that the reason that you're against what they want for, let's say, universal Medicare or whatever the case may be, it's because you're so mean and you yeah. just watch, love it, kick dogs in the alley and watch, oh, oh, brown people dying in the gutters. <laughs> no, this just it's a slander. It's ridiculous. What, what you then do is you say, since it is, in fact, not only not free, but probably the most expensive thing that we have to deal with. You know, open heart surgery is not exactly a, an inexpensive right. uh, procedure when it comes down to what you need to pull it off successfully. Since you're talking about something that costs not only money, but a lot of money, we want to talk about what is the best way to get this done so that everybody can have health care. Okay. So but but, but on, on some kind of form that makes sense. Okay, 2010. 2012, 2014, 2016. Mm -hmm. Elect Congress, elect a Senate. Don't start elect me. Elect a president. All right? Yeah. 
So the two biggest issues of those years was Obamacare, and we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare with something more free market. Yeah. And uh, obviously, we're, we're talking about immigration, build the wall. Where were we when we had all everything, all three things from 2016 to 2018? This is, this is the heartbreak of it all. And, and many people, I think most conservatives, look at what we didn't do. And our first inclination is to say, well, Donald Trump didn't try hard enough, but I don't think that's the answer at all. As you said, 2008, the, the Democrats come along and they sweep. They get the presidency, mm -hmm. the House, and the Senate. In 2009, they, they start this Obamacare thing, ram it down our throats, not a single Republican vote. We have to pass it to see what's in it, the whole nine yards. It's all done with all this ledger domain and, you know, and, and deemed as passed and all this crap. So in 2010, the American people, using the wisdom of the Constitution to turn the entire House of Representatives around every two years, you can just flush it every two years, we turn the House around pretty significantly. So now we have a Republican House in 2010. 2012, uh, Romney loses. The House and Senate situation stayed the same. 2014, we give the Republicans the Senate. Mm -hmm. And during that whole time, since the beginning of Obamacare, these representatives, these Republicans have been saying, man, we got the House, we got the Senate, you just give us a president to sign this and we'll get this thing out the door like that. Well, in 2016, we gave them the presidency too. And that's when we found out what they're made out of. In other words, the huge numbers of Republican representatives were saying, oh yeah, we're 100% for the wall and we are going to repeal Obamacare on day two. And they could say that as long as there was never any chance of it happening. In other words, I can stand up and beat my chest to my conservative uh, uh, you know, base, but I never have to go back and face people on this issue, so I get it both ways. Obamacare stays, and I get to talk about being against it because as long as there's nothing that I can do, as long as there's no chance of it happening, even better, as long as there's no chance of me actually voting on this in a meaningful way, then I'm all in favor of, of, of repealing Obamacare. But the second you had a Republican president who would have signed that bill, all of these people went squishy and soft. And, and most of those people are out of office now. And that's a, that's a good thing. Okay. That's not a good thing. So that we, it, we lost it, this, the two years. This comes back to the term limits issue then. Because if you know that you are, as what the founding fathers determined what politicians should be, they're supposed you, to be citizens. Citizens coming in, working two or four years, and then going back to your fields, going back to your doctor's practice, whatever it may be. So the, so the Senate has a six-year term, and most of the power of the Senate was taken away uh, with the 17th Amendment, where the people elected the senators. It used to be that the state legislatures appointed senators. And so here in California, we would have a large number of representatives going to the House of Representatives representing the people of California, but there'd be two senators that went to Washington representing the state of California, mm -hmm. representing the interests of the state against the federal um, power. That's gone. But I, I say, I really mean this. I say, you, there's no justification for a second term. I'm, I will say, if you, if you run as a representative, you do a great job, and, you want to get, and they want to elect your senator, fantastic, that's marvelous. But no re-election. And people say, well, there's hardly time for you to get established, and hardly time for you to get on the committees, and all the seniority and stuff. And this is what's causing us all the problems, right? Robert Byrd, when he died several years ago, uh, he'd, been, he'd, he'd been in the Senate um, since nine, since for 52 years, mm -hmm. 1958. Mm -hmm. That's longer than I've been alive. Mm -hmm. And he came to the Senate before color television, touch tone uh, dialing. Strom Thurmond. Uh, all, all of these guys. guys. Right. And, and, and it's not just the most ancient of them. Yeah. The bottom line is, Dave, if, if, if you go to the House of Representatives this January and you serve a two-year term, by the time your two-year term is up, you have no idea what's going on back yeah. home. Not really. You know, all of the problems that you were sent there to fix have changed. Okay. Now, there, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of questions at you uh, with our short time here, but uh, President Trump this morning tweeted about ISIS and saying that the intelligence agencies in the United States really don't have any clue what's going on. I'm paraphrasing, okay? He's picking a fight mm -hmm. with American intelligence agencies. Now, granted, you can go back to 2002, 2003, you can say that we had the wrong intelligence regarding WMDs, that was on a global situation, not just the United States, it was England, France, and everybody else. What's Trump doing right now? I don't know. Um, uh, this is the thing about Donald Trump. When Donald Trump comes out and says that, um, that the FBI is politically motivated to make sure that he's not elected, most people would look at that and say, this guy's just plain nuts. He's nuts. He's paranoid and he's, he's nuts, mm -hmm. except he's not. He's 100% correct. 
It's 100% correct. He was being bugged. There were investigations. The director of the FBI and the attorney general were in collusion with Hillary Clinton, out Bill Clinton, this whole deep state thing. I thought, uh, come on. No, it's, it's, there's no question about it. When you have FBI agents like uh, Strunk saying, oh, we're going to save, don't worry, we'll do whatever we have to do to save the yeah. American people from Donald Trump. He's right. That's, that is a weaponized government that is right. weaponized against conservatives. Um, but then on the other hand, I thought, you know, I, I said to myself, I have reservations about Donald Trump, but if he, I thought John Mattis was just phenomenal enough. We get the Secretary of Defense Mattis, that's good enough for me. So when Mattis resigns, this causes me concerns. It really does. It causes me concerns. But I don't, I don't live in the kind of world that, that I'd like to live in. Nobody does. This is the entire idea of conservatism as I understand it, is that your choices are not between a good and bad choice. Sometimes your choices are between a bad choice and a worse choice. And sometimes they're between a terrible choice and an absolutely catastrophic choice. And so when I look at this, I think, well, you know, I would like to have had a president would have, who would have listened to Mattis a little more because I have such high, res such high regard for Mattis. So you disagree with pulling out of Syria? I, I think that guys like John Mattis, and a number of them, David Petraeus as well, mm -hmm. um, I think that those guys understand the situation on the ground better than anybody in Washington possibly can simply because We've been there so long and we've gained so much experience at so much blood and treasure, the cost of so much blood and treasure to gain this experience. But, but you know, Mattis, Mattis is the guy, when you're talking about an insurgency, Mattis is the guy who went into a group of Iraqi leaders, you know, um, and, 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 and he comes in very humble, you know, so he, some, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically comes into all these Iraqi leaders and these warlords and stuff and he says, I'm coming to you with open arms. I'm not bringing any artillery. I don't have my guns with me, nothing. I'm begging you with tears in your eyes, don't F with me because if you do, I will kill every single one of you. Mm -hmm. And that's not the kind of thing that liberals are proud to hear at a cocktail party when it comes time to representing the, the United States. The United States should be Barack Obama talking. But no, those people needed to hear that mm -hmm. because they have a government that is not like ours. And this is something that many progressives and some conservatives can't understand. Other people are not like us. We have trusting relationships. We don't have any bellicosity towards France or Canada or Britain. You know, we have, we, we play around, you know, with insults, but, but w I'm not worried about a nuclear attack from Great Britain. I'm not worried about a nuclear attack from France. Mm. These are civilized Western countries. When you get into a, a dominance-based society rather than a trust-based society, you have to establish that power dynamic. And Mattis went in there and, and immediately had, and it was perfect. It's like, I'm not here to fight you. I'm not here to, to tell you what to do. I am begging you. That's an interesting term for a general in charge to use. I'm begging you with tears in my eyes. Yeah, That's an really actual, it's a statement of great humility is what it is. Last question for you, because we've got a couple of minutes left here. And I, I wanted to discuss with you as far as uh, your perspective of what is happening right now with our media. Mm -hmm. And if you can encapsulate your thoughts, because I know you can talk for an hour on this <laughs> issue alone, but uh, in the last couple of minutes that we have here, uh, there seems to be, um, you know, membership sites are down. We're seeing CRTV yep. and uh, The Blaze. They're, they're, they're coming yep. together. Daily Wise seems to be doing okay. They're selling their Liberal Tears mugs okay and their merchandise. But for the most part, there's no money in this, and, and a lot of people are suffering, and a lot of people are f trying to figure it all out. What's the landscape looking like to you right now? It's bleak, um, you know, and, and uh, before the 2016 election, it was crystal clear to me that the worst thing that could happen to the country would be Hillary Clinton would be elected, and it'd be the best thing that could happen for me personally. Conversely, the best thing that could happen to the country would be Donald Trump would be elected, and that would be the worst thing for me financially. Needless to say, I was very happy with the outcome. You know, I'd much rather be, I'd much rather be, you know, struggling in Donald Trump's America than, you know, making a ton of money in Hillary Clinton's America until the helicopters arrive. So, um, so that's the case. The left understands the power of the pop culture. They understand the power of emotion. And so, when you say that the left is putting money into this. It's not that George Soros puts $30 billion into the $30 billion into it, into things like Media Matters, that's trivial. When you take the total value of money spent on all of the education, the total, uh, not education, sorry, entertainment, mm -hmm. all of the entertainment, all of the movies, the cost of all of the TV shows, the cost of all of the news programs and everything else, the cost of the atmosphere that we all, or rather the sea that we all swim in, that is an enormously expensive undertaking and they spend it every year. 
and we try and get money for people to, to sign up as members for nine ninety five a month, it's, and it's like pulling teeth. And and the reason is because conservatives don't the conservative generally speaking understands that that that. Uh, that things make sense and things work a certain way and some things are unchanging and, and this is how it should be done. And they feel that if you're gonna be dealing with, arguing with people, you need to get to them, you know, through these facts and figures and logic and socialism's killed 150 million people. What else do you need to know? You know, right, that kind of thing. Right. But it doesn't work like that. People, nobody, nobody works like that. Everybody votes with their heart. I said earlier, uh, hypnosis, so I'll just close with this. Uh, to think about the power that the left has. You ever been hypnotized? I have, on stage. Have you? <laughs> I made a fool out of myself, but I've been hypnotized too. <laughs> it was in Vegas in the night. And for those of you who say you've never been hypnotized, I'm, I'm, I hate to be the person to break this to you, but you and I have been hypnotized hundreds of thousands of times. Sure, sure. And so is everybody watching. Yeah. If I go to a movie theater in Sherman Oaks at six, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday, and I'm sitting there with four hundred other Californians in broad daylight outside, and I've got a popcorn and I've got a soda, and I'm sitting next to my wife, and all of a sudden, you know. Freddy Krueger comes out of the dark, you know, right. and, and, and starts shaking his claws. Everybody leaps out of their seat, and they leap out of the seat because they're not in a theater in Sherman Oaks. They're in that house. Yeah. All of their, all of their critical facilities have gone down. And so the message comes in, and we, we do this willingly. It's called the willing suspension of disbelief. I'm going to believe in Freddy Krueger for an hour or two just so I can have some fun. But there's no filter there. And so we're constantly trying to get into people's brains. And what we should be doing is trying to get in through their eyes and right into their brainstem, right into their heart. And we wonder why, you know, we wonder why an ideology that has this much failure behind it yeah. continues to kick our butts. It's because they understand how people work and how they think. And if we don't, if we don't make some changes on this right quick, I think we'll be having some bad days up ahead. We always finish with me wanting more. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill. My pleasure. Again, uh, folks, find Bill at BillWhittle.com. He's got a great site and uh, content up every single week and uh, definitely worth following. And folks, you can follow us at uh, WhiskeyPolitics.net, America's Voice News, YouTube, all of your favorite podcast applications in the Ricochet Audio Network, and uh, David Sussman on Twitter. We'll be back again very soon. A very special thanks again to Bill Whittle. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. We'll be back again very soon at Whiskey Politics. Thank you.